8, we're going to read verses 18 through 20. Amen. Amen. Forty is weird. Anybody ever watch Friends? Show of hands, who watched Friends? Y- y'all remember when Joey on the birthday when he's like, "Why, God? Why are we getting so old?" That's why I feel. You know, it's like seventy-two. <laughs> Mama, you don't look a day over fifty. You know, absolutely. Yeah. So you got you got a fan right there too, clapping for you. <laughs> all right let's quit listen we got visitors here y'all act right let's 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 get to work all right matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20 jesus came and told his disciples i have been given all authority in heaven and on earth therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teach these new disciples to obey all the commands i have given you and be sure of this i am with you always even to the end of the age let's pray father i praise you for the victories of this church father five five baptisms today i just thank you for your movement because that's what it is Uh, father it's nothing we've done all we've done is be obedient to everything you've asked of us at this church and father i have no doubt that's why it's growing spiritually the way that it is it's growing the right way which is spiritual Father, we praise you for that. Ask that you continue to move this church. Ask that your presence is still known in this church each and every time we walk through those doors. Father, I pray over that every day. And Father, there's no doubt that I feel it every time I walk in here. And again, I thank you for that. Thank you for your presence. Uh, Father, today you've given me a message as we continue this series. Uh, The one that you've given me today, it's... it's, um, it's not going to be easy to preach, but Father, the thing I do know is that you will take over. Um, so I'm asking in this moment that you anoint me, from, anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Father, that you take all of my distractions, lack of courage, lack of boldness. Father, you replace all of that with your love, your boldness, and your courage. I ask these things in your name, Father. Help us to love, laugh, and forgive. Amen. Amen. All right. Again, today we're going to continue this series on the book of Revelation. But before we get started, I want to remind everybody in this room, we are not reading this book out of fear. We're not reading out of this book to get enamored with the end times. We are reading this book for one simple reason, church. What is that? To gain knowledge. Absolutely. That's why we are reading at the beginning of this, uh, the Great Commission, because that's our job. That's what we're set up to do. Jesus tells us to go and create disciples. Too many times I have seen churches and people get so involved in the book of Revelation that they forget their number one job. And I refuse for that to happen at this church. And I also want to thank you guys because this will be the sixth week we've preached on this. And I have not seen you guys fall away from the Great Commission. Thank you all. You've done an excellent job, church. And I need to, I need to understand that's a big deal. Because, again, I've seen so many churches that just get so enamored with it that they forget, oh, we still got to go out and build the kingdom. Great job, church. I've done an excellent job. Uh, the last five weeks of this series, we've covered Revelation chapter 1 through 17. Today... Uh, I'm going to go through 18 and 19. Get your Bibles out. Follow along. We got to get, get to work here because I got too many. We got a lot of baptisms today. I want to go ahead and pull up the timeline that I showed you guys uh, the last couple weeks. This is to give you guys a visual review of where we are. We've gone through all of this. We've gone through the seals. We've gone through the trumpets. Last week we ended at the seventh bowl. Okay, and that's when it was the fall of the great prostitute. If y'all remember reading about that last week. So today we're going to pick it back up in chapter 18. I'm going to look at 18 verses 1 through 2. After this I saw another angel with great authority coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. He called out in a mighty voice, It has fallen. Babylon the great 
has fallen. She has become a home for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. Now, remember, Babylon is this great prostitute that we talked about last week. If you'll notice the word she, you call that right there, she has become a home for demons. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Again, just to put it in review for you guys, Babylon was this great prostitute. Um, this prostitute symbolizes the flesh of the world. She is everything evil, corrupt, lustful, anything that's not of God. I mean, that's, that's what this great prostitute is. And all that drink of her lust and flesh will fall with her. But one thing I want y'all to look at before I move on, I, <laughs> this, this haunt of every unclean bird. You know, it's funny, man. I was sitting there reading that literally yesterday as I was getting ready for this sermon. And I was like, what in the world is this, this unclean haunted bird? Like, I mean, I get it when it talks about spirits and demons, and then all of a sudden they throw in birds. And I get the beast thing, like, right? Like, you get that too. Well, each week I've tried to show y'all visuals if y'all can remember, of, of what I feel these things may look like that's talked about in Revelation. So I've, I've got a picture of what I guess this bird may look like. I mean, listen, I ain't gonna lie. I hope that ain't in heaven. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I hope that's this haunted bird that she's talking about. All right, let's go to 18. Let's go to verse 3. Let's read verse 3. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Again, the great prostitute we're talking about. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxuries living, or luxurious living. These people, the kings and the merchants that are mentioned here in verse 3, are the corrupt people who will gain power and wealth from this prostitute's way of life. In today's world, these kings would be the politicians and governors, government leaders that are all for abortion, same-sex marriage, the confusion of transgender, taking prayer out of our schools, and a one-world government. These merchants will be the rich business owners who made their money from selling drugs, illegal weapons, prostitutes, pornography, sex trafficking, in any type of sorcery. That'll give y'all an image. That's who we're talking about here. We'll look at verse 4. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven, Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. Anyone living with the prostitute is living in sin. If you live in sin, you will not, uh, excuse me, you'll be punished by not being able to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I want to explain real quick to you what I mean by living in sin, because a lot of people get real confused when I say something like that, and it scares them. They're thinking, well, good Lord, I sinned, you know, five minutes ago. I guess I'm not going to go to heaven. There's a difference in sinning and living in sin, right? I think we can follow that. If you are living with the prostitute... If you're living in every unclean thing that's in this world and you're living in that, then you are living in sin. Therefore, you have no heart change. You see, when you become a child of God, you have a heart change. You feel that conviction, right? You realize that what you did was wrong and you're not going to live in that. You're going to fight to get out of that. So if you are living in sin, you know you're living in sin and you're not convicted. You don't feel bad about it. And you're not fighting trying to get out of it. I'll be honest with you. Jesus Christ, is not, he's not in your heart. He's not, because I need, you to, I need you to visualize this. Jesus Christ is everything good. He's love, right? If he's in your heart and you do something unclean, you will immediately feel that conviction. You know it's wrong. You're going you're gonna to feel the conviction before you do it. Now, our flesh takes over, and we lose sometimes. But as long as we bounce back, we're not living in sin. Understood that? Christian head nods. I need to make sure y'all got that. I love it when y'all do that. It's like the coolest thing. It's like a bunch of bobbleheads out there. <laughs> Let's look at verse 5 through 7. Oh, wait a minute. Is that right? Did I do that right? Yeah, 5 through 7. Okay. <laughs> she said after 4. That's messed up. <laughs> For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. 
pay her back the way she always, or excuse me, also paid, uh, and double it according to her works. In the cup in which she mixed, mix a double portion for her. As much as she glorified herself and indulged her sensual and excessive ways, give her that much torment and grief. Now, we're talking about Babylon. We're talking about the great prostitute. What we're talking about is this one world government, right? This is what's going to happen in Revelation. If you remember in Revelation chapter 6, in the throne room, there was a vast amount of God's people, we preached on this, that were under the altar. And they were asking God, when are you going to revenge our death? When are you going to take care of these evil people on earth? Right here, that moment has come. We're going to clarify that. I want to go look at, uh, and actually I'm going to read this. We didn't get this in. Chapter 19, verses 1 and 2. After this, I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting, Praise the Lord, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. He has avenged the murder of his servants. So again, in chapter, was it chapter 6, his servants were saying, like, when are you going to do this? We got to 19, guys, and that's when it's happened. He's finally avenged it. He's finally destroyed the great prostitute, the evil ones that corrupted the earth. He's finally done it. But there's so much more left, and we're going to get into a lot of that in a couple weeks. But now that God has avenged his people and destroyed the prostitute, I want to move on to the main topic of today's message, which is the marriage feast of the Lamb. We're going to read chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. Then I heard something like the voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. Verse 7. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure. For the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. We're going to spend a lot of time right here for the rest of this sermon. Guys, we're going to be invited to this marriage feast. How do I know that? Because we are the bride. The church is the bride. His people, his children are the bride. A bride always goes to the marriage feast, guys. I mean, have you ever seen, <laughs> you ever been to a reception and the bride didn't show up? Don't answer that question. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah, I mean, I, Lord, I hope not. Guys, I need you to envision this feast. This will be the greatest celebration that heaven has ever seen. All of God's children will be there. All who reach salvation will be there. That's this feast, guys. I need you to envision this. I need you to think about you, you know, you, once you get in, you can't imagine a table that big. You know what I'm saying? Like, who, whoever did that whole eating on, uh, on state line? You know what I'm talking about? Where they put this long table down state line and people come out and they eat and everything? You know what I'm talking about? Everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, yeah. What'd you say it was? Dine on the line. Anybody ever done that? Show of hands. You should have if you didn't. It's really cool. But it's this long table, right? It goes all the way down state line. Like, if you can envision, you're going to walk into this room, and you can't see the end of the table, guys, because that many people will be there. That's what I need you to envision about this feast. And the cool part is, like, no matter if you believe, if, if it, <laughs> okay, we were talking about this the other day. I'm pre-tribulation. I believe we won't go through any of this. Some people are mid-tribulation. Some people are, 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 are post-tribulation and so forth. You know, here's the thing. We're all going to be there. It doesn't really matter. And, and here's the thing. We may not agree on that, but there's one thing we agree on. Jesus wins. And that's what matters, right? But, but I ain't going to lie to y'all. Like, I got in a, a little bit of a debate with somebody that said we were mid-trib. And I'm like, no, we're pre-trib. And we got in this debate. And then I looked at him. I said, listen, I'm be honest with you. When we're up there and we're at the feast, I ain't going to argue with you. I don't, care who, I don't care who got it right. We're both there. That's all that matters, right? I'm not going to argue with somebody about that. But anyway, we'll talk more about that in a couple weeks because I want to prove some points. 
But the best part, guys, about this feast is Jesus is the host, right? That's the best part about this. You ladies, this is the other cool part that I picked up because you know I live with four women, so I'm going to talk about this. You ladies, anytime y'all get invited to some, like I went to a gala last week, right, or, or something along those lines. I, I mean, men, I don't know about y'all. My, my wife, she's freaking out trying to figure out what to wear, like, like freaking out. And, and she's got this closet full of clothes, you know. The cool part is, guys, you ain't got to worry about it, ladies. You get fine linen. He's already given you what to wear. That right there is half the battle of going to one of these events for you ladies. It's shoes. I'm sure he got some sandals or we're going to be barefooted. It's going to be one of the two. That right? Absolutely. You know, men, but I ain't going to lie to y'all, okay? I'm going to say this real quick because she may watch this, but don't argue with her. Just let her go buy a new outfit, okay? Keep going. Some of us, us, well, us good Christians anyway, when invited to a feast or a get-together, we'll reach out to the host and ask, hey, what can we bring to the event? What can we do? What can we, how can I help you with the event? We're not going to have to do that at this feast, guys. Not going to have to do that. Jesus is the host, and when he's the host and you sit at his table, all's taken care of. It's time to rest, and that's what this feast is. It's time to rest. And you know what's really cool about this feast we didn't even do anything. This is Jesus' victory. And he's hosting us. Think about that. You know, I, I, I mean, that, that would just, I just know my mentality. When I go in there, I'm going to be looking around like, what can I do? Can I, can I, is there trash I can pick up? Do I need to straighten some seats up? Do, do I need to bring something? Is there something I can do? And Jesus is going to look at me and he's going to say, shh, you're my guest. Sit down. He's going to pull my seat out for me. He's going to look at you. What do you want to drink? I'm going to say, you got Miller Lite. I mean, just. <laughs> I want you to think about it, though, guys. That's him. He's the host. We don't have to bring anything or do anything. We don't even have to bring our clothes. He's got it. No, we're not going to be naked. He's got it. <laughs> See, I was trying to be serious, man. You're going to do something like that. There's no stress involved in preparing for the, uh, attending this feast. Um, there's no social anxiety. There's no nerves about what to say or who's going to be there. Because that's us, right? That's us. We're, we're you know, I got to go to this event. What am I going to wear? Who's going to be there? I don't like a crowd. I don't like to be around a lot of people. I want you to imagine if that's something that you struggle with, you're fixing to walk in this room and there is no anxiety. There is no stress. There's Jesus literally standing there pulling a chair back for you to sit down and pouring you a glass of wine and saying, rest. That's what that is. I don't know about y'all, I need to rest. At this feast, there's only joy, peace, rest, love, and, of course, the love of the groom, which is Jesus Christ. You know, I was thinking about this feast, and um, this, is, this is a micaism. But we're going to go to this feast. We're going to walk in. There ain't going to be no food on the table. None. Jesus is going to get us all sat down. And he's going to pray over us. And then he's going to say, or I'm actually going to say, like, Jesus, I'm hungry. Where's the food? And he's going to say, I'm the bread of life. I'm all you need. Not going to be any food on that table. He's all we need, y'all. And from that point on, it don't matter what we eat. And we may not have to. Because again, he's the bread of life. I want to go back to who will be attending this great wedding feast. There's one word to describe the people that will be in attendance. And that word is committed. The committed will be at that table. You have to really, and I mean really be committed 
to Jesus Christ in order to be invited to this feast. You got to be fully in. I mean, I want you to think about something like you're not going to marry somebody if they're not fully committed, right? You know, you get down on one knee, will you marry me? Well, let me think about it. I ain't marrying you. You better not be thinking about nothing. Better be. Actually, to be honest with you, when I proposed to Amanda, she didn't say nothing. <laughs> and she was crying, and I didn't get up until she said yes. I was like, now, listen, you got to tell me something. Like, but think about it, guys. If, if you're fully committed, you're all in with your spouse, right, in your marriage, in the marriage covenant. That's what you're wanting. Jesus wants the same thing. People that are not fully committed to him are not going to be invited to this table. This morning, okay. You want me to tell you who ain't going to be at this table? People that go to the gym and, and never do leg day. They ain't going to be at this table. <laughs> just, just hear me out. Because if, you, if you're working out and you're exercising, all right, you got to be fully committed to, to your whole body. Okay, like we got to be fully committed to Jesus Christ. Like today, I was at the gym, and, and my boy Austin Reeves back there in the back. Austin Reeves looked like the Bugs Bunny this morning. Like, like he was, he was, he was over here. He was over here. You know what I'm talking about when you play baseball, Bugs Bunny? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Please tell me y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like I'm, ju I'm, I'm just 40. Okay. But Austin, man, he was over here, he was on legs, and he was over here on chest, he was over here on back, and he was over here, and then he got on treadmill. And, I was, and I'm thinking, when he, when he did that, it, made me, it reminded me about this sermon, like, you got to be all in. You got to do it all. If you just go and do, you know, chest and arms all the time, what are you going to do when, when God gives you something heavy to carry? You're going to buckle because you got twigs for legs. <laughs> Guys, you got to be fully committed to your spiritual muscles to get there. It's not that funny. I'm going to move on. Y'all, I... Guys, is your life all about Jesus or is he just an add-on? That's the people that won't get to the table. If he's just an add-on. If he's just a one-hour Sunday, once-a-week thing for you. That's just an add-on. That's not commitment. I mean, if, if, would, you, would you give your spouse just one hour a week to sit down and visit with her? Or him? That's not commitment. Jesus is looking for fully committed people to be at that table. Do you focus more on him or do you focus more on the worldly things of life? I'm going to tell you one way you can answer this question. You ain't got to do it right now because, you know, I don't want you to feel like a bad Christian. When you leave, grab your cell phone. Swipe left, see how much time you spent on your phone in the last week. And then think about how much time you spent with Jesus last week. I mean, I'm being serious. You spent 13 hours on your phone. And you prayed for two minutes each morning and you came in here on a Sunday for an hour and a half. It's not very good. Where's your commitment? Full commitment's what it's going to take. I'm going to tell you all something else that's taking your commitment away. And it's not the drama of this world. It's not what's on the news. I need you all to hear me right now. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. You all hear me? That's not what's taking you away from your commitment from God. Let me tell you what's taking you away from your commitment from God. is soccer. Baseball. Work. Golf, or just flat out being lazy. Yeah, I love them, but I, I got I got friends that don't go to church because they say they got to get their kid to a sporting event every weekend. What are you teaching that kid? Let me ask you a question. 
let's say that kid is a really good athlete, becomes a college player, okay? And then let's say that kid becomes pretty good and become a professional player. By the time they're 35, they've retired. And what you've taught that kid is for 35 years, that's the most important thing when we need to be teaching them about eternity. And most of them ain't going to make it pros and most of them ain't going to make it to college. Your work is keeping you away from being committed. You're so wore out that you won't get up and go to church on Sunday. You're tired. You know what? Find another job. I mean that. If anything is keeping you away from your relationship with God, you disassociate yourself from it. Period. If anything is taking you away from your family, you disassociate yourself from it. But guys, we've got to start teaching our children today. It's not about some sport on the weekend. It's not about vacations on the weekends. Get your butt in church. And let me tell you something. It ain't got to be this church. I, we've got a lot of people watching online. We've got visitors here. Uh, uh, y'all don't know this. But it ain't got to be here. I don't care where you go. Just go. Amen. Go to God's church somewhere. Enter his house on a Sunday morning and get after it. Learn something. And then take it with you when you leave. Amen. That's commitment, guys. So my question, here's the thing. Th Jesus is inviting you guys to the table. He's inviting you guys to the table. My question to y'all are, are, are you too busy to attend? You too busy to show up? He's committed to us. We're going to talk about that next week. The commitment that he gave for us. I'm going to close with this story and then we'll get on to baptism. In Luke chapter 10, most of y'all know this story, but Jesus came to Martha's house. Mary and Martha were there. Martha finds out Jesus is coming. She freaks out, like, like most of you ladies do. Got to clean the house. Got to sweep. Got to wash the dishes. Got to take the trash out. Got to clean everything up. Got to get some food prepared for them because they're going to walk in the door. Got to have some food for these guys. A bunch of men coming in here. They're hungry. Got to give them some food. You know, and, and so Martha, she's flipping out, man. She's tripping out. She's looking around like, where Mary at? She lazy. What's she doing? She's supposed to be helping me right now. And she walks outside, and there's Mary sitting at the foot of Jesus. Martha was too busy to go to the table. Don't be too busy. Don't be Martha. Be Mary. When Jesus gives you the opportunity to fall at his feet and come to his table, you run. You get there. And you worship him. Amen.